Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Brandon Lancaster. And my name is Rachel Duke. And on behalf of the Norview High School Administration, I would like to welcome you here to the second high school town hall meeting. We are also here to commemorate the late Honorable Leroy, Leroy Roundtree Hassell Sr. Excuse me. Judge Hassell was not only a Norview graduate voted most likely to succeed, he was also the first African American of the Virginia Supreme Court, serving from 2003 to 2011. He participated in the first Norview High School Town Hall meeting in 2009, which we are very thankful for. Judge Hassell was a leader and a role model to all of us, which is why we are remembering him now. Before we begin, I would like to bring some special attention to some very important people we have here this morning. Mr. John Richardson for organizing the event for this year and back in 2009 for our first town hall meeting. Um, the assistant to the chief of police, Mr. Joseph N. Clark, um, and the Advanced Placement Teacher Specialist, Mr. Bruce Brady. And the next voice you will hear will be Mr. Munga. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. This is a, a great honor and a pleasure to uh, participate in this program. Um, I'm here right now to uh, give special acknowledgement to uh, my dear friend and colleague, um, John Richardson. Um, John uh, was former deputy uh, city attorney with the city of Norfolk and was a mentor to me and, uh, and it was his brainchild to uh, have a town meeting um, at Norview uh, several years ago and uh, it, it was the fruit of John's uh, commitment to diversity in, in uh, the legal profession but also across uh, uh, all professions and that first program was called Diversity in the Professions. Uh, there's a proverb uh, in the scriptures that says that the thoughts or ideas of a righteous person are, uh, tend to plenteousness or abundance and benefit. And in other words, when someone has a good idea, it enriches people. And I wanted to thank John and to acknowledge him um, as uh, being the person to want to enrich you all, you young people, um, with this great idea to uh, put uh, wonderful people, esteemed people before you to plant a vision in your heart so that you would chase the dreams like Justice Cecil uh, exhorted us uh, three or four years ago. And so uh, I, I want to thank John. John is very esteemed in the legal profession and he uh, last year was the, um, um, uh, received the reward of um, professionalism, the highest honor that could be bestowed upon the Norfolk by the Norfolk Portsmouth Bar Association for his uh, work in the profession and in the community. So we want to thank John and give him a hand for uh, his idea here. Good morning. My name is Jacob Higgins, and our first judge is the Honorable S. Bernard Goodwin. He earned his undergraduate degree in economics at Harvard University, then earned his Juris Doctor from the University of Virginia in 1986 where he received the Ritter Award for Honor, Character, and Integrity. After working at the law firm of Wilcox and Savage for eight years, he served as a general district court judge until he was subsequently appointed to the first judicial court in Chesapeake in 1997. On October 10, 2007, Governor Tim Kaine appointed him as judge pro tempore of the Supreme Court of Virginia, replacing the retired Judge Elizabeth Lacey. And on February 8, 2008, he was appointed a 12-year term by a unanimous vote from the General Assembly. Norview High School, please help me in welcoming Judge Bernard Goodwin. Um, hello, my name is Kahari McLean, and I am a doctor scholar here at Norview. Um, I would like to introduce the Honorable Judge Junius P. Fulton III. Currently, Judge Fulton serves as the chief judge of the Norfolk Circuit Court and serves as the chair of the Virginia Electronic Filing Study Group. After being appointed in 1998, Fulton has watchfully presided over the Norfolk Drug Court. And as a member of the National Association of Drug Court Professionals, 
Fulton, Judge Fulton served on an exec, serves on an executive task force in charge of drafting key components for re-entry court programs. So please help me give a round of applause for the Honorable Judge Junius P. Fulton III. Hello, my name is Angela Mahalik. Today, I would like to introduce the Honorable Lori D. Hogg. Judge Hogg, prior to law school, was employed as Assistant Director of Admissions at Randolph-Macon College. Judge Hogg served as an Assistant Commonwealth Attorney, the Supervising Attorney of the Domestic and Family Violence Unit, and served as Director of the Child Abuse Program at CHKD. Judge Hogg was appointed for a second term to the Juvenile Domestic Court and is a member of Blessed Sacrament Catholic Church. Please give a warm welcome to Judge Hogg. Hello again. Um, a town hall meeting is essentially a meeting of everyone in the community who decides to attend. In this case, it's all of you. In town meetings, the attendees voice their opinions and hear responses from elected officials. Today's questions are centered around the theme, how I became a judge. Students have come prepared with specific questions to obtain personal insight from our distinguished panel. Here's what to expect. Mr. Mungo will facilitate the Q&A session. Respective students are chosen to come up to the mic to ask his or her question, after which he or she may sit down. Once that question is answered, Mr. Mungo will assist the next student with a question. This will continue until all questions have been answered, after which one of our presenters will then make a closing statement. And now I will turn it back to Mr. Mungo to get started. Thank you. Um, our student presenters did an outstanding job. Would you give them a round of applause? It's not surprising that uh, excellence prevails at Norview High School and uh, I'm, as a former uh, Norview student uh, from way back in the day, uh, I'm really thrilled to see you all out here and it's great to be here. Um, who's the first student that has a question uh, for uh, our esteemed panel? First student want to come up? Don't be shy. Hello, I'm Chris Hart, three-year Dotson Scholar, and my question is, would you support term limits on federal judges? Why or why not? This is just a general question to all judges, please. I want to make sure I heard your question correctly. Okay, so everybody can hear me. Was your question, would we support um, term limits on federal judges? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, that's a very good question. Being that I'm probably up here the low man on the totem pole, being that, you know, in Virginia you've got your district courts, which is juvenile and general district, and then you've got your circuit court, and then you've got your appellate courts, and finally you end up over here at the Supreme Court. I'm probably the um, least knowledgeable person to answer that, but my opinion would be, um, I think I would support age limits but not necessarily term limits. I think there's experience that can be gained and knowledge that can be used and why replace people if they're there with all that experience. So that would be my position. Okay. That's an advantage that they have, which allows them to truly be independent of the other political uh, processes that occur in government. As state court judges, we are not uh, appointed for life. We have specific terms that we are elected for. So consequently, when our term ends, we have to go back through the reappointment process. Federal court judges don't have to deal with that at all. That may be what prompted the question. Um, and sometimes there are times, I suppose, when state court judges wish they had a uh, lifetime appointment. But in any event, uh, in terms of the question, perhaps term limits uh, may not be the answer, but as Judge Hogg pointed out, age 
of restrictions. For example, when you reach a certain age, mandatory retirement, you can take senior status, and you can sit if you desire to do so, if there's a need for you. That might be an appropriate way to handle that. Out. Oh. I would not uh, venture an opinion as to whether federal court judges ought to have term limits or not, but I can certainly tell you why they do not have them. Federal judges are appointed for life so that they can make decisions um, that won't be affected by politics. And if you look historically at many of the uh, monumental changes that were made in our society, they were made by federal judges who could actually do what the law required them to do without fear of reprisal from anyone. So it's a very important um, part of our judicial system. And um, it's uh, made a significant difference in our um, jurisprudence. So I would say that without uh, giving you my personal opinion on whether it ought to stay that way. Who's our next uh, questioner? Right here. How you doing? My name is Malak Cook. I'm a senior Dawson scholar, and I'm attending Morehouse College in the fall. My question is to all of the judges: Do you find it hard to remain publicly nonpartisan? Uh, personally, I don't. I mean, I, I don't have any problem with that at all. One of the beauties of my job, I think, is being a judge is I get to wake up every morning and go to work and do what I think is right. It doesn't get any better than that, um, in my honest opinion. And um, so no, I, I, I very much enjoy the opportunity to be neutral. And I think by nature, I'm a analytical person. And I like the idea of being able to look at any issue and come up with what I think is the solution to it. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't found that to be um, difficult either. I think being able to know that you're gonna go into and hear a case and make a decision based on the law, it's our responsibility to remain neutral, to remain non-biased. Um, I think we also have a responsibility to keep personal opinions out of our decision making. But obviously, as judges, we bring whatever we have as part of our experiences with us you know, to the bench. And you have to sometimes try to make sure that your experiences don't interfere with your decisions. Um, because our job is basically to follow the law. That's why we're there. As Judge Hogg pointed out, uh, the challenge of a judge, particularly a trial court judge, is to leave those personal experiences behind and let your judgment be based upon the law and the facts that you find them to be. Um, Justice Goodwin is an appellate level judge, so by the time the case gets to him, all the facts have been basically decided. He just deals with it based on the law. On the trial court level, Judge Hogg and myself, we have to look at these people when they testify and make a judgment as to who do we believe, what do we believe happened. Personal experiences have a way of sometimes uh, trying to intrude in the back of your mind and influence what you're gonna do or what you believe. Uh, for example, when I was a child, my father was murdered. So I have a special uh, affinity, if you will, for persons who are victims of crime. Uh, but I don't let that uh, empathy uh, get in the way of trying to make sure I understand specifically what happened and whether or not the person who is accused is the person who committed the crime, uh, as opposed to being clouded because of sympathy that I might have for the family or the victims in the particular case. All right. Next student, and uh, come on up. Uh, and if you would, after you ask, ask your question, go ahead and have a seat so that the camera can get a good you know, shot at the judges, okay? Yeah. All right. Hey, I'm Tevin Vaughn, third year Dotson Scholar. And my question to all of you are, how did you know you wanted to become a judge? Well, 
The path for me to becoming a judge started with wanting to become a lawyer. And my decision concerning my desire to be a lawyer was basically formed as a result of my personal experience, life experiences, when my father was murdered. I was in the third grade. Uh, I even went to the trial right in the same uh, building that I serve in today. Um, and I observed the process. Uh, I recall, and this was many years ago, uh, that just about everyone in the courtroom was white, with the exception of my family and the defendant. And then there was a, a gentleman who I knew from the community who came into the courtroom, and he was an attorney. His name was J. Hugo Madison. And I recall the respect that Mr. Madison received when he came into the room. Uh, and I knew he was a lawyer, but I didn't really perceive what his role was at that young age. So as time went on, uh, I started to become more and more interested in the judicial process, the legal process, and how judges worked and how attorneys worked. And I wanted to be a prosecutor. So I knew at a very young age that I wanted to go to law school. And certainly when I was in high school and in college, I kept that in mind. But there were times when life got in the way. Uh, I was diverted, if you will, by uh, circumstances. Uh, but I tried to keep in mind I wanted to go to law school, so I needed to do well in school. So ultimately, when I became an attorney and practiced at the prosecutor and defense counsel, uh, it's always challenging to be a lawyer because you have to persuade. Um, when you get an opportunity to become a judge, you become the person who makes the final decision. You determine what uh, justice will look like in your courtroom. So when I, when I realized that I had an opportunity to be on that side of the courtroom, if you will, it was something that I aspired to. But the opportunity came up because circumstances. It wasn't as if I was campaigning for the position, an opening became available. Someone suggested that I uh, apply for it, and I was ultimately interviewed by the governor and appointed while the General Assembly was not in session and ultimately uh, elected by the General Assembly. So that was my path. I think, um, unlike Judge Fulton, I did not know at a young age what I wanted to do or that I wanted to become a judge or even go to law school. I ended up being a business major at University of Richmond, and when I was in college, I took a part-time job in the admissions office of the law school, and so that was my first exposure to law, and I thought, wow, this is pretty interesting. I think I might want to go to law school, and then I took some time off after college and worked um, as an assistant director of admissions at Randolph-Macon and decided, yeah, I do want to go to law school. One thing Judge Fulton said was opportunity. Opportunities have a way of sometimes just presenting themselves and you have to kind of keep your eyes open and look for them. After I graduated from law school, the job that I first took was a prosecutor job in the city of Hampton. And it was the only job that I applied for right out of law school because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, and it turns out I loved it. Stayed in Hampton for a while, but um, the next opportunity brought me to Norfolk, and what ended up happening was I ended up starting to develop a specialty in the field of child and family law, which led me to an opening at Children's Hospital when they developed a child abuse program. So all of it for me was very accidental, you know, going to school thinking I was going to be a business major, deciding to go to law school, and being fortunate to have everything just kind of come about and pursue those because of interest. So my message would be look for those opportunities and take them because they're there. And sometimes you don't have to have a well-laid plan. You just kind of keep your eyes open. I was born and grew up in uh, Southampton County, which is a rural county about 50 miles to the west of here. Uh, my background is working class. Neither one of my parents even finished high school. And I guess growing up in a rural community uh, in the South in the 1960s, I felt like I uh, witnessed a lot of people who were not treated fairly. And I always thought that if I were a lawyer, I could make a difference as far as that is concerned. So I grew up wanting to be a lawyer. I think ever since I was probably in about second grade, although I've always been flexible in how I would get there. You know, I thought about majoring in engineering or business um, because I always thought, I, first of all, I needed to make a living. <laughs> 
And I, I was always afraid that I wouldn't have the money to go to law school. So I wanted to make sure I majored in something where I could uh, make a living uh, doing it. I was blessed that I was given the opportunity to go to college and, and go to law school and become a lawyer. And I always had in my heart to become a public servant of some type. I really didn't know how I would serve, whether it would be uh, uh, in politics or um, in some other uh, arena. And as Judge Hawk says, opportunities present themselves. I was given the opportunity to become a judge. And I have to say, when that opportunity arose, or I guess a little bit uh, before it arose, I come to the conclusion that that probably would be a good way for me to make a, a contribution to society and to make a difference. Because there's one good thing about being a judge, when you are the trial court judge, you're the person who's making sure everybody is treated fairly. Um, and uh, that appealed to me a great deal. And uh, that's how I ended up becoming a judge. One of the things that uh, those answers uh, brought to my mind is that um, preparation, being prepared for the opportunities is essential and each one um, of our judges, they were prepared for the opportunities that presented themselves. You know, it's time and chance is how things happen because I do believe that there's a destiny for each person and the desires of the heart direct the preparation. And then preparation meeting opportunity creates these uh, positions or yeah, opportunities to serve and uh, I'm not trying to take over the thing, but I thought about what Leroy Hassell said about um, achieving excellence, is that when you aspire to excellence, it prepares you to help people. You're better prepared to be a helper. And so uh, that, I heard that in these answers too, that their preparation um, allowed them to be helpers of people. Who has the next question? Right here. Good morning, my name is Jonathan. I'm a senior at Norview. And my question is, thinking back to your time in law school, what lessons did you learn that still impact your theories about American law and your ruling on cases today? I guess as I think back to law school, the thing that I recall the most are the tools that I learned in order to be a good advocate and to be a good lawyer because primarily um, what they try to teach you in law school is how to, quote, think like a lawyer. And a lot of that has to do with analyzing a problem. And the thing that I come back to time and time again is uh, a professor I had um, who uh, really was very unconventional in, in presenting things. You know, he didn't talk in terms of like legal theories, et cetera. He, was a law, he was an economics uh, PhD also, and he really talked about solving problems that came up. And the thing that um, is so important is that he talked about characterizing it. And what you find in the law, and what I come to time and again, so many instances, what the answer is will depend on how you characterize the problem. You know, what kind of problem is it? And as you try to solve that, and that, that comes up over and over again, especially in what I do now, because people uh, are claiming that, or, no, no, <laughs> a lot of times they, they allege that their errors have been made in the trial that they had. Um, and a lot of it has to do with how you characterize what their, quote, problem is, <laughs> as to whether or not there was a mistake that was made. So of my legal training, I think characterization and analyzing problems is, uh, I think, the most important thing that I learned. I don't really think that, um, um, I, I really don't feel like I was like uh, impressed by anybody to adopt any type of a particular ideology or jurisprudence in my legal training. I think of it more as uh, an opportunity to, to learn technical skills, which I was um, blessed to have the opportunity to do. I'm not sure I can add much to that. I would agree with what Justice Goodwin um, has stated. I think the one thing um, 
that I would mention on top of that is presentation. Law school teaches you not just analytical thinking and theory, and but presentation, presentation, how attorneys are responsible for presenting the case and presenting their facts. And you learn that, I mean, you've got opportunities if you go to law school to participate in moot court or trial advocacy programs, and you learn how to do public speaking, um, you learn how to be persuasive. And as a judge now, it's interesting from the bench to watch cases in which you have very good attorneys and cases in which you have maybe not so well-prepared attorneys, but yet their clients have the facts on their side. So um, that's one thing I think that I learned in law school that I carried with me, other than I should never be a tax uh, attorney, because I learned that I wasn't very good in tax or accounting. Okay. One of the most interesting experiences I had in law school was not necessarily directly in the classroom, but an opportunity I had to work at the National Center for State Courts. And this was about the time, this was a couple years after uh, John Hinckley tried to assassinate Ronald Reagan. And Hinckley, as you may recall, and it's even now in the news, was acquitted uh, because he was found not guilty by reason of insanity. And there was a big debate going on at that time among policymakers, people who make the laws concerning whether or not the insanity defense was an appropriate um, uh, part of the criminal justice system. So I had an opportunity to work at the National Institute. It was a uh, National Center for State Courts, but they had an institute on mental disability in the law in that particular uh, organization. And we wrote a book, and it talked about the insanity defense and how it developed and all of that. And after going through that process of understanding that, you know, when people commit crime, they committed the crime, no question they committed the crime. How can you turn around and find a person not guilty by reason of insanity? Uh, and the public has a problem understanding that because we all saw him do it. So how can he be not guilty? But the whole point is that the person is not criminally responsible because of mental disease or defect. And that, that is something that even now when I sit in cases and oftentimes we don't very often find people who are not guilty by reading of insanity, but we see various levels of understanding and being criminally responsible. And even today, when I sit and I listen to cases and I hear people talk about the things that they were going through at the time they committed the offense, I see those varying degrees, but I understand that the threshold is so much higher. So while they are still responsible, they're not gonna get off, if you will, because they're not guilty by reading of insanity, those issues are something that I still have to think about and consider when you uh, consider what the appropriate punishment might be for the person who committed that offense. So that's something that I still think about from way back in law school. All right, who's our next student? Right here. Hi, my name is Alan, I'm senior at Norview, class of 2013. Um, my question is, with all the negative media in today's society, especially with crime and unethical, unethical behavior, how do you guys keep a positive attitude as being judges? Sometimes it's, sometimes it's easy to get disenchanted with life because of the cases that you hear. Uh, but for every uh, bad case, there are many good circumstances that occur. I mean, I've had situations where people have been victimized, burglaries and things of that nature, and the victim comes to the sentencing hearing and they hear the defendant testify. I had one case in particular where the defendant was a uh, Navy uh, officer who apparently was extremely intoxicated and broke into this woman's house. Uh, he didn't steal anything, but it traumatized the family because some months earlier the family had suffered a break-in and they have a teenage daughter who was really traumatized by this. So obviously the family was upset, he pled guilty. He was getting ready to lose his uh, Navy career, if you will, behind this stupid incident. Um, he testified at his sentencing hearing and the victim was sitting there and I'm watching the victim as the defendant testified about how remorseful he was. And then I watched the victim as the defendant's mother testified about how remorseful her son was for what he had done. And I could see her anger fade away to the point where she leaned over to the prosecutor and said something along the lines of, can we do something to keep him 
uh, so he won't lose his Navy career behind this. And so in, in that circumstance that I found, I saw a person who forgave him, if you will, and as a result of that, they worked out something where this person did not lose his Navy, Navy career, but he was held responsible for what he did. So for every bad case, there are good cases that occur too. I feel so blessed to work in the juvenile court, and I can answer this question that was asked pretty easily, because juvenile court gives us the opportunity to not only punish for crimes that are committed, that's the delinquency part, but also to rehabilitate youth. So I'm fortunate in that I see many, many juveniles who come before the court on sometimes minor, sometimes major crimes who come from backgrounds where they've struggled or they might have, you know, their father or their mother might have gone to prison. They might need to be redirected in terms of education. And to see someone come in who's hanging with the wrong people and could be on the road to pretty significant gang affiliation and a life of crime, turn themselves around and write to me later that they've graduated from college and thank me for sentencing them um, is a tremendous benefit. And um, in addition, juvenile court gives judges the opportunity to look at families and make decisions to help keep families together and to help keep children safe. And for me, there's nothing more rewarding than seeing kids turn their life around, keep children safe, and um, keep families together. So that, that's an easy one for me. I guess the thing that I would point out is um, what you see in the media in general are things that are sensational. They're, they're not what happens on a daily basis. Um, and I would think that uh, people who watch television in a lot of instances think the world is a lot worse than it really is. Um, and the blessing about being a judge is you can make sure when somebody comes in front of you you're not the crazy judge. I mean, it, this is not going to be the case where, you know, somebody gets a thousand years for stealing a piece of bubble gum or something. I mean, you know, because you're going to make sure that's not going to happen. And so I, I don't think the media <laughs> affects me one way or the other as, as to how I uh, address things other than to uh, make sure that uh, when somebody's in front of me or a case is one that, um, I'm personally going to analyze that it's going to be something that's going to be done in a very rational and fair way, and hopefully in a way that can be explained um, that makes sense to people. All right, who's the next student has a question? Right here. <clears throat> My name is Scott Klaus. I am a senior here, and I was wondering how you feel a minority has hindered your ability to get where you are. Well, honestly, I don't think it's hindered me at all. I mean, I, I, I've been extremely blessed um, from beginning to end. It's no doubt that in our society there is racism. and. Um, it's a lot better now than it was when I was a kid, to be perfectly honest with you. And it's getting better all the time. But the reality is there's opportunities galore for everyone. And certainly, if you are willing to work hard, things will work, turn out fine for you. I, I think that the people sitting up here, the four of us are testaments to that. And I think what uh, we all have to strive for is personal excellence. That's what you want. I mean, it, it ought to be the type of thing where, um, you know, you're just the best, and that's why you get the job. <laughs> you're just the best. That's why you got into school. Uh, and you're always striving to make sure that is the reason why you're going to make it to the next level. And if you know what it is you want to do, I think you've got to all out put forth all your effort to do it. And you've got to be fearless to the point of not being afraid to fail. Because 
Everybody falls short at some point in time. You pick yourself up, you get back on the horse, and you do your best. You wake up every day, and you figure out some way, something you can do to help you to get to the goal that you want to achieve. And I don't think you can use the fact of whatever your disability is or whatever your uh, race is or your nationality or your religion, I don't think you should use that as an excuse because it really isn't one. Um, as, as, as somebody like um, my mom would say, if they don't let you in the front door, you go in the back door. If they don't let you in the back door, you go in the window. If they don't let you in the window, you come down the chimney. You figure out a way to get to where you want to go. And that's what you have to do. I don't think that being a female in my career has hindered me. Kimberly asked me this question this morning, and I told her, for me, it probably worked to my benefit, because at the time that I was appointed, um, the only female judge was retiring off of the Norfolk Juvenile Court. So they were looking to fill that seat with a female so that the bench represented the population in the community. So for me, now maybe for some female attorneys that are applying to or have applied to some very big corporate firms, might have different experiences, but my perception um, knowing people that work for those firms or that really things have changed dramatically, um, especially when it comes down to the difference between men and women. So I would concur um, with, with everything that Justice Goodwin has said. I too concur with what Justice Hitzel and, Justice, and Judge Hogg had said, but I would also point out for you all that times have changed in a lot of ways. And the question is not so much historically has there or is there, but the question is what it will it be now and in the future. And as uh, Derek Mungo pointed out, you know, being prepared to meet the opportunity is so important. So regardless of what the challenges might be, whether it be your economic background, your uh, gender background, your racial background, or any of those other issues that might separate you from somebody else. If you are prepared, all those barriers that other people may put up there really don't mean anything. It's just a question of how do you get in, as Justice Goodwin said, through the front door, back door, chimney, window, whatever. Just being prepared to do it. Um, I want to just piggyback on that particular uh, point, is that if, if you understand that you are prepared there are going to be people who see you that you don't even know that can advocate for you or, or, or recommend you. As a matter of fact, uh, my first job as a prosecutor, uh, J.P. Fulton, um, recommended me to uh, the uh, Commonwealth's attorney. And uh, J.P., he, he knew me. He knew my preparation and whatnot. And, and that helped me get the job. And, we, we were prepared to do it. And, and so, so there are going to be people who see you, and they're going to know you. And if you're prepared, even if there are barriers that have been erected to try to hinder you, there are going to be some people who are going to help you get around, to get in the, in, in the door, or to through the chimney. So who's the next student that uh, has a question here? That's a scholar right here. OK. My name is Montrose Way. I'm a four-year doctor scholar, and my question is, how do state and local courts differ from federal courts? Can you repeat, repeat the question? Um, I was wondering, how do state and local courts differ from federal courts? How is the, local, how is the state court different from the federal court? I would think the, the, the primary difference is in subject matter that they deal with. Um, the um, state courts are courts that are going to deal with um, your everyday life for the most part. I mean, if, if you have a traffic ticket, you're going to go to a state court. If you do most crimes that you think of, we would call common law crimes, murder, rape, robbery, you're going to go to a state court. Um, if you're going to have uh, some type of a, uh, a dispute with your neighbor, you're going to go to state court. Um, and, and that's what state courts do. I mean, that, that's, that's the subject matter of our uh, 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 jurisdiction. 
Federal courts, on the other hand, have a limited jurisdiction. The primary thing that federal courts are doing are ensuring that people have their rights under the United States Constitution. So in federal court, it has to be a federal question first. It has to be something that has to do with a federal statute in order for you to be there. So it's going to have to deal with the Constitution or some other federal law. Or it could be an instance where there's diversity, where there's somebody in North Carolina who's done something to somebody in Virginia. And our jurisprudence has developed such that we allow that person to go to federal court so basically they don't get home cooked. You know, the federal courts are supposed to be the place where people are, are going to be treated fairly as opposed to, you know, I'm a Virginia judge, you're a Virginia person, hey, I'm going to give you a break type of thing. So they deal with cases having to do with diversity, and they also deal with cases having to do with conflicts between the states. So the primary difference between what the federal court does and what the state courts do has to do with um, subject matter more than anything else. Now, having said that, there certainly is some overlap but I, I, I think that's the basic answer to your question. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think there's much more to add uh, than that other than, um, you know, in state courts you have your Commonwealth's attorneys that represent your cases. In federal courts you've got your United States attorneys. Um, and the only other thing that I would add is federal judges get paid more. <laughs> and <laughs> Just to put in a plug for the state judiciary and uh, for my friend Leroy Hassell, I, we sat on the same court together, we worked in the same law firm together, um, and he just was my boy. But um, 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 that's not really correct because, say for instance, now I think the judges on my court are paid about the same as people in the Fourth Circuit. So, and it's because of Justice Hassell who made sure to go to the legislature and try to, to make sure that the judges did receive pay raises. So um, I think overall, uh, you know, I, I guess it depends on which court you're in as to, as to the um, amount of pay, but um, we're, we're competitive. I'll defer to the, to the top justice here. <laughs> I don't understand that. The Supreme Court of Virginia had the final word on these issues. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, no, no. And, I, and I would say it's all attributable to Leroy. And I, and I guess I just think of, um, uh, well, like I said, he did a lot to help for compensation of judges in state courts. And, and that's, what, that's what he was about, uh, helping people um, um, at, at that level and also in encouraging us um, as uh, lawyers to pursue excellence and to pursue opportunities that are available. Okay, who else has a question? Okay, young lady in the back right here. Yes. Hello, I'm Deja Moore, and I'm a junior here at Norview, and I was wondering what have been some of the highlights in your career? Well, I'll take, that's the easy one for me. One of the highlights in my career has been an opportunity to serve as the uh, uh, the drug court judge in the city of Norfolk. We started the drug court program uh, because I spent a lot of time before I became a judge as a prosecutor and defense attorney and always found it um, uh, tragic, if you will, that, that people who had so much potential would have their lives ruined by a drug addiction. And as a result of that drug addiction, find themselves in a position where they were stealing and committing crimes to support that addiction. And it always troubled me that if drug addiction is something that can be treated, and yet uh, these people, because of their um, lack of financial resources, steal to support that addiction, they find themselves in the criminal justice system, and then we incarcerate them, and then we bring them back, and we say, don't use it again, and they expect them to do it. It just doesn't work that way. And as someone said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Uh, so the drug court program has given me an opportunity to work with people who are skilled in treating addictions within the context of the criminal justice system with probation and the prosecutors and the defense attorneys and making sure these people get the treatment that they need so that they can rehabilitate their lives. So that's really been a highlight of my career. I think 
the highlight for me, which led to some other opportunities, was being able to step into the job at Children's Hospital, the King's Daughters. I had, prior to that, prosecuted many, many um, baby homicide cases. And the, the one that led me to make that switch was, um, you know, these are the kind of cases you never forget, but a, a baby, um, I say baby, but it was a toddler that was murdered on Christmas Eve um, by his mother and placed in a trash bag under the kitchen sink. And on Christmas Day was carried in that trash bag by the mother and her boyfriend and thrown, tossed, uh, down an ocean view into the water. When I read the autopsy report for that child and the history, I realized that A, I had to step out of prosecution of those cases because I was extremely fatigued and um, could not handle one more case in which a child was harmed like that. It was at that time that the opportunity became open at Children's Hospital, which was a more positive position to step into. And my, my role in that job was to develop a program where agencies could come together, law enforcement, social services, prosecutors, anyone that worked with families, to help identify children earlier, to try to save them from what had just happened, to put services in place sooner, to identify victims of sexual abuse sooner, physical abuse sooner. So for me, that was an opportunity, and that program is strong and, and running with a with a, um, a pool of professionals, medical, mental health folks. And I love my job as a judge, wouldn't give it up for anything. But for me, that was probably the transition and highlight of my career. I guess it's hard to define a highlight, but I have to say that um, each time that I've been appointed to a court, has been a highlight for me. I mean, because every time that happens, the legislature has decided that you are a person that they entrust with the tremendous responsibilities of the position. That happened when I went to General District Court. It happened when I went to Circuit Court. It happened when I went to the Supreme Court of Virginia. And it's uh, humbling, I mean, to, to think that um, uh, these very, very, uh, these people who care about the community believe that they would entrust this to you. Um, I've always thought that to be a highlight. And I also have to say a highlight of my career was just becoming a lawyer, you know, um, passing the bar exam and them giving you a license to say, we believe that you have the training and the integrity to take care of people's problems. We're entrusting you with that. We're giving you a license with that. We're entrusting you as the person who's going to protect our society to make sure that people are treated fairly. Uh, to me, it was, um, once again, humbling and, and uh, just uh, a thrill every time I think about it. All right, who has another question? Okay, young man right here. Good morning, how y'all doing? My name is Travis Sumler. I'm a senior here at Northview, uh, fourth year Dotson Scholar. And my question is, throughout your process of becoming a lawyer, well, after your undergrad years, like from graduate school up until now, what was the most enjoyable or memorable, exciting, whatever word you want to choose, uh, moment of the process in the least liked moment? I suppose the, the least uh, appreciated and uh, enjoyed moment was that first day in law school. You had the excitement uh, of uh, the adrenaline that's pumping. You want to know, am I up to the challenge? This is my lifelong dream. And you go into the classroom, and I had the uh, uh, fortune of having uh, Timothy Sullivan, who was the former dean of the law school at uh, William and Mary and later the president of the College of Women Mary as my contrast professor. And he was a Harvard trained, very erudite, very uh, intelligent man. He would stand right next to you and say, Mr. Fulton, 
in the case of so-and-so and so-and-so, the court decided what? First day, I am scared to death. And it's like you just go on automatic pilot. You just, you know you read the stuff, so you just blurt it out. I got it right. You know, that so it, it was the, the scariest moment was seeing the challenge and the most exhilarating opportunity was you met the challenge. So all wrapped up in one. I'm trying to think if I have a least enjoyable moment. When I first started prosecuting in Hampton, I was trained under a very aggressive, uh, very aggressive prosecutor who I think to, to try to get people that worked under her to become good prosecutors, she was tough and, and mean. Um, but I, I would go into her office, I remember doing one of my first child sex abuse cases and I s asked a question and she grabbed the Virginia code book and she slammed it on the desk and she said, read the code. So I kind of remember that happening a lot. The most enjoyable moment for me, um, you know, there's a lot of them, but personally, when I became a judge and having the opportunity to look at my parents um, at the time that that occurred, and my, my father's no longer here, my father actually had, I was so blessed to have him at my investiture, and six months later he, he passed. But, you know, my, I was the first in my family to graduate from college. My father's father was first generation from Italy and came to this country and became a bread delivery driver. That's what he did. My father grew up in a home with two bedrooms and six children, and he shared a twin bed with a sibling um, until he got married. So came from very poor backgrounds, and my, all my father ever wanted was to send his children to college. And I was the first to graduate, and to, to be able to look at him and know that all his sacrifices had paid off to me was the biggest accomplishment. Probably the least enjoyable experience was being a, a young lawyer because after I finished law school, uh, there's a lot you still don't know about the practical part of, of, of practicing law. And you know, you've done well in school, you've done well in law school, and then you start practicing. I thought I had a brain tumor or something. You know, I mean, because I used to be really smart and now I didn't know anything. And um, you know, just going through that learning process of, oh, I forgot to do this. Oh. I forgot to do that, or gee, did I make that deadline? Ah, maybe I didn't. Ah, let me check the book, you know. And, and uh, so it was a it was a steep learning curve, but I think it's something that everybody goes through, and uh, you work your way through it. Um, you do, and um, you know it's just uh, 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 part of the learning process. One other thing, and, and I have to apologize for Judge Hogg to Judge Hogg because I was sitting here thinking and running numbers in my mind, and you are exactly right. All federal trial court judges make more than all state trial court judges in Virginia. <laughs> uh, that, that is true. And so I'm, I'm very sorry. I apologize. I should have kept my mouth shut. <laughs> One of the things I wanted to share with you is that your success your dreams and you're chasing your dreams. When you fulfill those dreams, everybody that loves you rejoices. Everyone that has met you rejoices. And so uh, to encourage you to pursue the dreams that you have because um, it's not just that you are going to get the benefit, but there's so many people that are conferred with honor and joy because of your success and your hard work. Now who has the next question? Right here. Good morning. My name is Antonio Kelly. I'm a junior here at Norview, third year Dotson Scholar. And my question is, um, what are some pros and cons of becoming a judge? The pros and cons of becoming a judge. Um, 
One of the pros of becoming a judge is that uh, you'll find that once you take on the position, uh, everything you say is funny. And you don't get the irony of that because everything you say is not funny. But people around you will laugh at everything you say, particularly the lawyers, because they want to get on your good side. So, uh, so one of the cons of a judge is to realize that everything you say is not funny. And to realize that um, don't uh, perceive yourself as more important than you are merely because of the position that you have. You're entrusted with the position. It's a great responsibility. It's not yours for life. Uh, you didn't inherit it. It's not like you're royalty or anything. But you're entrusted with the responsibility, so you have to um, appreciate it for what it is, but don't let it go to your head. One of the um, pros, too, I think, is you, I guess you can flip this as a pro and a con, but being a judge can be very draining when you hear case after case all day. Sometimes you have to remind yourself to take at least 15 minutes for lunch in between, but um, that can kind of be a con. But when you balance that with someone that, an attorney that may work for a firm where you have to put in billable hours, you have to keep track of your time, it's a benefit as a judge. You just basically sit on the bench and you hear your cases. You gotta do some research sometimes. You have to read reports but you go and you do your job and the mental strain you might take with you. But, um, but that's definitely a plus to not have to do all the administrative work that, that a lot of other lawyers do. Um, I think a con too is a lot of times being in a social setting and this might not just be limited to judges but also attorneys and you get you know people that come up to you. Oh, you're a judge? I got a question for you. Can I run something by you? You know, everybody has different problems and they want an opinion. So you have to really be careful to not give a professional opinion um, or make, give somebody advice, judicial advice outside of the courtroom and that's tough to do sometimes. I guess one of the pros of being um, a judge is that your job is public service. I mean, you, you every day, you get to wake up in the morning and try to make the Commonwealth a better place in which for people to live. I mean, it, it, it's a dream. Um, also, it's a very positive, especially as a trial court judge, as opposed to being a lawyer, for me, was the control over my life. Um, when you're a practicing lawyer, you have all kinds of deadlines that are being imposed upon you from the outside. You know, you've got judges who are giving you deadlines. You've got clients that are giving you deadlines. You've got your partners who are giving you benchmarks to meet. Uh, and you, you have a, a lot of uh, uh, things that you are required to do that you really don't have any control over. If you hire me to be your lawyer and you've got a, a hearing at 5 o'clock, it doesn't matter that, you know, my kids got a soccer game at 4.30. You know, I, I gotta get the job done. I gotta take care of, of your desires. Uh, being a judge, especially a trial court judge, gives one the opportunity to have more control over, you know what, it's one o'clock, we're gonna have lunch. Everybody ought to eat. <laughs> when, when you're the lawyer, you don't get that call. You know, you've got to do what the judge wants you to do, or if you're in a client meeting, you've got to do what they expect of you to do. So I, I think that control is also um, a big pro. One of the cons of being a judge, um, I think, is the things that you are exposed to, and, and Judge Hogg um, touched upon it. Uh, in many instances, you see people at their worst. I mean, you see cases where terrible things are happening to people. Um, and, and you're the person who's trying to, to uh, make sure that society addresses that. Typically, when people come to see you, even in the civil arena, it's because they're mad at somebody. Somebody didn't pay them money. Somebody didn't do this. Uh, you know, the evil stepmother's trying to take all the inheritance from the children. Uh, you know, it's typically um, scenarios where people are uh, misbehaving 
And sometimes it gets to the point where you think, is everybody like that? Because that's what you see and you start um, thinking that, wow, this is, um, people are a lot worse than I ever thought they were. Um, and then something like Judge um, Fulton talked about will happen and it'll give you that spark to say, no, no, this, I'm just seeing people at their worst. So I think that's one of the, one of the cons of the job that we have. Um, I guess um, some other things would be, um, well, well, I mean, I'll, I'll just leave it there. That's okay, someone from this side have a question? This is a quiet side, okay. Over here, young lady. My name is Oriana Freeman, and I'm a junior. And my question is, has there ever been a case that you had to rule in a certain way, that even though you personally felt differently? Well, I guess um, the answer would be yes, because I, I, I think, are you saying there are instances where the law requires one to do something that one would prefer not to do? Yes, that happens. And I really uh, believe that judges have taken an oath and they have to follow the law. It's not what Bernard thinks ought to happen. It's what the law requires to happen. And that's what I'm going to do, is I'm going to do what the law requires me to do. And as a judge, a lot of times you have discretion and you exercise it based upon your best judgment. But in some instances, you don't. And when you don't, you don't. And you've got to do exactly what the law says. So um, there's certainly been instances where um, uh, I've certainly had to do exactly what the law said, even though I might have thought a particular penalty was harsh or I uh, thought that there might have been something um, different that could have been done. But I just had to do my job. So yes, that happens. I would agree, it, it happens. Um, I would say, not, not often, but fr you know, frequently we'll see that. Happens a lot in my court in domestic violence cases. Um, there, there are frequently cases in which there might be some physical evidence of abuse and you know, my gut is telling me one thing, but frequently in domestic violence um, victims recant later, take back their statement because they want to stay with whoever might be abusing them. And if that happens, uh, depending on the facts and the case, but very frequently there's insufficient evidence if you have a victim that's giving a totally different explanation. So even though my gut might be, I know he or she is being, you know, beating the, the heck out of whoever the victim is and there might be children involved, I got to follow the law. So those are difficult. As Judge Hawk just said, I, I totally identify with what you just said because we've all had cases of trial court judges where you have people before you and you're looking at the evidence and you can see it. And then the witness says, well, it really didn't happen that way. And it really is because you know, and they will sometimes admit, we need him to come home. He's the only one that's working. The kid's missing. All of those reasons. And you know in your gut you have this feeling, you know, but you don't go with that. You go with what the law says, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And the testimony of that witness was just enough. So also, as Justice Goodwin pointed out, the law required the certain circumstances where judges are, are not allowed to use their discretion. Oftentimes in criminal cases, we see people on the absolute worst day of their life the day that they did, the very worst they could do. And it could be a person who prior to that day, outstanding student, wonderful father, whatever. But if they commit one of the offenses which the legislature has required a mandatory minimum, I have no discretion. Use of the firearm, three years. Second time, five years. Eight years total. I, it doesn't matter. No matter how I might empathize, no, even if the victims say, we wish you didn't have to do that. I have to follow the law. So we do have those opportunities, those challenges, if you will, where we have to be challenged 
to put aside our personal feelings about something and follow the law. All right, Let's see a hand over here. Hello, um, I'm Ernesto Angeles. I'm a senior here at Norview. And I was wondering if you had any life lessons you would like to share with us, or maybe even like a word of wisdom concept that you held on to uh, throughout your career. I, I got one. Uh, my grandmother raised me after my parents died. And I can remember um, I had friends in my neighborhood who were in high school, you know, had nice cars and things like that. My grandmother used to say to me, uh, don't you worry about that, you just work hard. Don't you worry about that, you just work hard. You know, after a while, that's just going in one ear and, and going out the other. Because I want that now, as opposed to waiting. Uh, and the, the principle that she was teaching me is that you pay the price now so you can play later. Pay now so you can play later. Study hard now so that later in life you can enjoy the finer things of life. And it's something that I've tried to stick to, uh, and it, and it really is something I think young people your age need to realize. Pay the price now so you can enjoy the things you want later, when you can really appreciate it. My advice would be um, balance. Um, no matter what you do, but particularly if you are in the legal field, um, or you become an attorney, look for balance in your life. Work is, you definitely wanna work hard. You wanna get places, you wanna you know, achieve your dreams, but you, you have one life, and if you end up having children, they have you know, 18 years of childhood and that's it. So you've gotta look for balance with your families, balance with your health. There are too many people that jump into a job and all of a sudden time is gone. So, um, just remember the things that are important. And um, uh, you know, I'll say this uh, in reference to the late Chief Justice. Um, when I first became a judge in 2007, I was appointed in um, April. And I think I, I told you that six months later my dad passed. So I had to make a phone call to the Chief Justice about really six weeks in to being on the bench. I had no built up leave time. And my parents lived in Florida and my dad was suffering from leukemia and I wanted to go and visit him and I didn't have the leave. And I made a phone call to the Chief Justice because that's what I was directed to do. And he said to me, he said, you do what you need to do. You take the time that you need to take. He said, this is a job, it'll be here. Family comes first. And that was from Chief Justice's cell. I would say work hard and do your best. I really think that the limitations that are placed upon us are the limitations we place upon ourselves. I think that anything that a person puts their mind to do, they can do it. Don't sell yourself short. Now having said that, most things that are worth having require a lot of work. It's not going to be easy. You are gonna have moments when you get discouraged. You've gotta believe in yourself enough to keep pushing through that and to get to the next level. Um, you know, I remember as a, as a little boy, I was in third grade and I was, I always studied really, you know, I, I was, my kids say I have OCD or something. But, you know, working on things and we took a test and I got 100. My buddy Ronnie, he gets an 80 and he's like, oh, that was easy, that was easy. I was like, I thought it was pretty hard myself. I got 100, but it was hard. And I asked my dad about that and he scratched his head. He said, well, and my dad um, went to like sixth grade and I probably asked him too many questions. <laughs> But um, he scratched his head and said, well, you know what? I reckon if you're not trying to get them all right, it is easy. And that's life. I mean, it can be easy, but if you want to get it right, if you want to do the best you can do, 
it's gonna probably be hard. Um, and there's no getting around the hard work that's gonna be necessary in order to, to succeed. But you can do it. And then I, I think back to so many of my friends I've met in uh, uh, college and law school, and they're doing amazing things that, you know, uh, you, you just wouldn't believe if you just knew them, because they were just kids, just like, just like I was then, like you guys probably think of now. And you're like, hey, this is Jimmy on TV. <laughs> what's, what's he doing? You know, he's, he's heading up this big investigation or something. You're like, or you see somebody on television talking about, um, you know, some procedure or something. Doing like, that knucklehead? Come on, man. Are you serious? Uh, and, and those people that you see on television that are doing these great things are just like you and I. I mean, uh, um, they're, no, they're no different. They just decided, hey, that's what I want to be. That's what I want to do. Hey, I want to be a CIA agent. So, you know, one of my buddies ends up heading up, you know, the CIA in, in, in the Paris, in their office. You're like, I, you know, wow. You know, that's what you did. And then, you know, of course, now he's not, he wasn't a spy anymore. He could tell all the interesting things he had done. But it was because, hey, that's what I want to do. So that's what I'm going to go do. Um, and you've got to make up your mind that you want to do it. I know I was talking to uh, somebody earlier that mentioned they wanted to, uh, like, um, go to MIT. Why can't you? I mean, you know, you can go there as easily as anybody else. But what you got to do is, you know, hit the books. Do your background work as far as your SATs are concerned, your SAT2s. Make sure you go to any prep course that they offer. Make sure that you do anything you can do to get those numbers and scores up as high as you can possibly get them up. And then apply. I mean, because they're going to pick, somebody's going to go. I mean, they, <laughs> they're going to have 1,600 kids in that entering class, and why can't you be one of them? You can't if you really want to do it. The diligent hand should rule. Diligence means hard work, but that diligent person is elevated. And so that what you're hearing is that hard work, yeah, it's, it's hard, but to get the benefits, you're going to have to put it in. Who has a question? Are we, are we near the end now? Oh, OK. Right here? Don't be shy. Um, my name is Ada V.C. Stratton, and my question was, throughout your judging career, what has being a judge taught you? I never thought of it that way, as in uh, being a judge teaching me uh, as much as what I have brought to the table and all the life lessons that I draw upon in trying to decide the cases. And I think people hesitate to answer that question because I think most of us believe that being a judge hasn't changed who we are. I mean, it's, it's merely what we do. And I think in a lot of instances, who we are might and somehow manifest itself in how we do judge. But I would hope that, you know, you know, honestly, people standing up when I walk into the room or as Judge Fulton say, people thinking I'm funny when I wasn't funny before or cool when I wasn't cool before hasn't changed me at, at all. And I, I, I don't know that, um, you know, being a judge has made me any different than I was before. Um, I guess if I learned anything, I guess it would be the desperate straits that some people are in and in a lot of instances that people do things that um, they regret uh, later uh, impulsively. Um, but I think, honestly, I already knew that. I mean, I, don't, I, I, I just I, I see it more on a, on a daily basis. And I think many times when you see people in front of you as a judge, you think, but for the grace of God, go I. Um, and, uh, but, I, I, but that was something my mom taught me, <laughs> you know, years ago. Um, so I, I guess it, it, it manifests itself um, in that you really a lot of times um, um, uh, see things that you might not see on a daily basis, but I don't know that it's really um, taught me anything I didn't know about myself before.
I, I think the statement, you know, but for the grace of God, you know, that could be me sitting there. I think that thought is caught. Um, many judges reflect on that when you see how people make instantaneous decisions that are mistakes. A lot of people make them, no matter where you're from, what your background is. Um, and I think it's taught me to appreciate the good things in, in life because everybody has baggage. Uh, there might be a few that don't have any problems, but most people have problems, whatever it is. And um, so it's, it's taught me that you really you can't really look at someone and be able to tell what's going on in their life. You can't, you don't know. Because what I've learned is when you look into these sentencing reports and you get deep down into a case, there are things that people go through that you have no idea. So um, it's taught me to appreciate and, um, you know, be, be kind to, to your neighbor. Um, because people do go through a lot, unfortunately. To echo what Judge Hargett just said, um, one thing I think being a judge has changed for me is that I don't judge. And by that I mean in my individual life, when I, you know, sometimes you see somebody and you reach a snap judgment about a person based upon what you see. Um, and we all do that, it's like a shortcut to go through life, you know. You see somebody, you make a judgment. You see somebody, you make a judgment. I try not to do that because, I have, as Judge Hogg said, you know, you read these reports, you, you hear these cases, you see there are a lot of complexities, a lot of things that go into people's lives that make them the way they are. So instead of judging on a personal level, I, I just leave my judgment when I got to put on the robe and, and do it then based upon the law and the evidence and all of that stuff. But in my personal life, I, I just don't judge people like I used to. All right. All right, my name is Robert Hall, and my question is, I just would like to know, uh, what are some traits that are essential to becoming a successful judge or a successful lawyer? One might be the ability to listen and not just hear, but listen to what the person is saying. Because sometimes people say that you hear the words, but there's more to what they're saying than it's the words that they use. Certainly, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, certainly patience. Uh, sometimes it takes people a long time to be able to explain what's happening, so patience. Courtesy, respect, um, certainly the, you, you have to work hard and have a knowledge base and, and I guess be bright to a certain extent. I'm certainly not going to say that I was ever the smartest person in my class or anything like that. I was average. Um, but you work hard and um, you treat people with, with dignity. And I think as a judge, that's something you have to have. Um, in order to be able to sit up there and have the people that you're judging respect your decision. I agree with what um, both of the other judges said. I think one of the important, or probably the most important thing the judge has to do is to listen. Um, and listen without judging. This is, we're just trying to find out the facts, I'm listening. And the thing that I always worried about when I was a trial court judge is things being lost in translation. People have different ways of communicating. Um, they use different words. They've got um, uh, different cultural approaches to saying things. And I want to listen carefully so that I don't miss anything. I want to understand exactly what you are trying to tell me and not me imposing upon what you said all these things that I've brought to the table. So I, I think listening very carefully is important, not judging, being patient, and I think part of the listening is being courteous, you know, at, to the point of saying, well, I don't think I quite understood what you said as opposed to, just finish, just, you know, you, you can't really rush, I, I think, the, the process at all. Um, and of course, having done all those things, I think it's helpful to be diligent, 
in wanting to make sure you get the right answer. I think it helps to be humble because you say, well, I don't understand. Because there are, you, if you're the person, to me, sitting there as a judge, you can't be afraid of saying, well, I don't know the answer. Let me look this up. Or, you know, Mr. Richardson, you made a good point. I did miss that. I'm not, I'm, it's, it's okay for me not to know everything and for me to listen and try to be informed. Because I understand at the end of the day, I, I'm, I've got to make the call. That's my job. That's what I have to do. But I don't have the job because I know everything. <laughs> I have the job because I'll listen and I'll be diligent in trying to reach the right answer. Here. Uh, my name is Imani Mwamlima, and my question is that I was wondering, has there ever been times where you've been overwhelmed with work and that has hindered your ability to work at your full potential, and how have you dealt with it, and how have you been able to, um, how has it affected like, your personal life? Well, I can honestly say I have been overwhelmed. <laughs> by work and by uh, issues um, that I have to deal with. I think there, there are two things. One is you draw upon all the skills that you've learned through life. All those things you learned from your parents in Sunday school and your minister and the things you learned from your coaches and your teachers um, and the things you've done in the community. Um, and the things that you've learned that have been successful for you as far as, you know, how you deal with the situation. So as far as work is concerned, I think it's important to, you know, take a deep breath and figure out what you need to do. And personally, what I do is I write things down. I make lists because so many times when you feel overwhelmed, it's because you don't have a plan as to how you're going to get everything done. And so, you, you know, I think you, you want to have you know, things that have worked for you in the past that have helped you to be successful and to realize that you can bring all of those things to bear upon whatever circumstance you find yourself in. The other thing is, as Judge Hogg mentioned before, you gotta have balance. You know, you, you can't get so caught up in what you're doing in work that you ignore all those other important aspects of your life. And I think when you take care of the other aspects of your life, that helps with that feeling of overwhelm, of being overwhelmed. Because the reality is, the world is gonna go on, <laughs> you know, despite your little problems. Um, and there are other things that need to be attended to, typically other than this thing that you find so overwhelming at the moment. So uh, you gotta keep perspective also. So I think, you know, you need to have balance in life. I think you need to have uh, a plan as to how you're going to deal with whatever it is. And you, I think a big part of it is identifying why you feel that you are overwhelmed. Because there's something, whether it's a deadline or whatever, figure out what it is and then come up with a plan to take care of it. I think I'm a list maker too. I think that helps to put things down. But this would be especially for those of you that are um, women that might also have families and a career. And certainly men and fathers have taken a much bigger role. And some even are the um, primary caretakers at home now. So I'm not excluding um, men in this. But, you know, right now, there are certainly more women that take on a dual role of career and um, maintain a family. So that's tough. And um, you have to kind of realize that you can't do everything. You have to delegate. And um, one thing that I do that kind of helps, I have three children and they're getting older now. One's in college, one's in high school, and one's in elementary school. But I've had this rule since I've become a judge, because you hear cases all day. And the minute I would walk in the house, they all have things they need to discuss whether it's a problem or homework. So I have a rule that the first 10 minutes I'm home, I just kind of, you know, that's when I kind of change into more comfortable clothes and I can't really address any problems then. Just give me 10 minutes to unwind and then I'm ready. So it just kind of helps you um, mentally, um, you know, 
get yourself prepared for what's next. So that would be my advice. It's interesting listening to Justice Goodwin and Judge Hogg's responses to that question, because these are all, um, everything that they pointed out are things that I do as well. Um, never overwhelm, challenged perhaps, but not overwhelmed. Uh, right now we are down to seven judges on our court from the original nine. And so the dockets, uh, the number of cases we have, it's really at times very challenging, but we make lists. We have priorities. There are certain things that will be done, there are things that we will try to do, and then there are things that if we can get to them, we will. Uh, and maintaining a balance at six o'clock, no later than six, I'm out of here. So we're gonna do what we can then, and get, establish that balance in my life, go home, first 10 minutes, don't ask me how the day was. <laughs> then we could talk about everything else in the world, right? So striking that balance. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kimberly Bethay, and I'm a senior here at Novi High School. I would like to thank you all for attending our second town hall meeting. As well, I would like to thank our special guests, the Honorable Judge Fulton, Fulton, the Honorable Judge Hogg, the Honorable Judge Goodwin, and also the Chief Assistant of Police, Joseph Clark, the Assistant City Attorney, Mr. Mungo, and also the former Deputy Attorney, Mr. Richardson. <laughs>